89 says this, For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Jeremiah 10, 6 and 7 Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. Who should not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations, in all of their kingdoms, there is none like you. We should fear God because of who he is. There is none like him. We should fear God secondly because of what he has done once again the psalmist helps us with this by the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap he lays up the deep in storehouses let all the earth fear the Lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Think of it. What has he done? He spoke, and the world came into existence. In order to help us get a picture of it, the psalmist says, he gathers up the waters in a heap. He holds them in his hands. The God that we serve, the God before whom we stand in awe and fear and wonder is the God who created the world in which we lived. And yes, we believe he created it and he didn't need any help to do it. He created it out of nothing in the exact time periods the scripture says he created it. He spoke it into being. He is the almighty God and we should worship him because of what he has done because of who he is because of what he has done and thirdly because of what he is doing all of God's great work is not in the past he is at work even today we should fear him because of what he is doing Psalm 66 5 says in the present come and see the works of God he is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. Let me ask you, what is he doing today that should inspire such awe and fear in us? We could make such a list, but I want to focus on one thing. If you wonder why we should be in fear of God because of what he is doing, let me just say one word, forgiveness. <laughs> Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4 read like this. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. Now watch this. That you may be feared, that we may hold you in awe. These verses remind us that if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and some of us were forgiven of our sin when we were born again so many years ago that we have forgotten and we no longer allow ourselves to wonder in this truth that a holy god who was 100 percent righteous with no flaw in him could accept us through the simple process of his forgiveness and i am forgiven I am a sinner like all of you, but I am a forgiven sinner. Only two kinds of sinners, those who are forgiven and those who are not. And forgiveness has been made available to all of us if we will just accept it. And it comes right from the heart of Almighty God. It is the great work he is doing today. And when we hear of people whose lives have been changed and we listen to what they are saying and, and how they are saying it and how God brought them through a process and now they are Christians and their whole life has been changed and they're in a whole new direction from where they once were. This life transforming thing is called forgiveness and it's the work God is doing among us today. It's the great work of God, your forgiveness and mine. 
Before I go on to the last part of this message, I want to answer a question that sometimes people ask. And that is, how can I love God and fear Him at the same time? Because the Scripture seems to say that we cannot do that. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. The Bible tells us that we're to fear God and we're to love God, and they're not in conflict at all. This verse reminds us that when we truly know the fear of God, we will understand the love of God. And when we truly know the love of God, we will understand the fear of God. They are not mutually exclusive, only in our own minds. Now, when I told you at the front of this message that uh, this doctrine was kind of overwhelming to me, here's where I'm going with that. I just was not aware of how many places in the Bible we are given promises if we will fear God. I, I mean, I can only give you a few, and there are many. These are things the Bible says will be ours if we learn how to fear God and hold Him in esteem as we are called to do. First of all is the promise of provision. Here's the verse. Psalm 34, 9 and 10, O oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. The Bible says if you fear God, he provides for you. Number two, the promise of protection. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. When you fear God, he protects you. The promise of purity. Psalm 103, verses 12 and 13. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. According to these verses, godly fear is a necessary ingredient to sanctification. The fear of God is not only the key to our knowledge of God, it is essential to our maturity as believers. If we do not have a healthy awe and fear of God, we cannot grow. We can never be mature. We will always be like little children. But when we understand who He is, it inspires in us a desire to know Him more and to love Him better and to grow in our relationship with Him. The promise of provision and protection and purity. Here's one some of you will like. The promise of prosperity. Psalm 128, 1 through 4. Once again, watch for the fear word. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. This teaches us that you can have a God-fearing family. <laughs> I grew up in a God-fearing family. And you know what? I learned how to have a God-fearing family. So my family is a God-fearing family. And I'm watching my kids, and they're building God-fearing families. The Bible tells us that when you fear the Lord, He prospers you, and it's not just financial things, but he prospers you in the well-being that we all seek for our lives. Here's the next one. And this one I put at the top of the list, but I don't want to do this just for myself. This is the promise of prolonged days. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. 
The Bible says, and this is a principle, a general uh, principle like we find in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, in the long run, over the long haul, if you fear the Lord, well, well, what happens if you fear the Lord? Well, you don't ruin your body with alcohol and drugs and promiscuity and all of that, and and so you're just going to live longer. It also says that God blesses those who fear him. This is pretty exciting stuff. Provision, protection, purity, prosperity, prolonged days. And here's a word some of you have never heard before, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because it starts with a P. (laughs) Perpetuity. Do you know what that means? That means the continuation of something into the generations that go forward. Remember I told you that if you have a God-fearing family, you will create God-fearing families going forward? It's right out of the Scripture. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 5.29 Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Psalm 103, 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Men and women, when we fear God, we create an environment in which our children grow up so that when they go out of our home to start their own home, they create families that fear God, who then create other families that fear God. We can do this if we follow the Word of God. And the key is our attitude toward God Himself when we fear Him. Now, these are only samplings that are in the Bible. If you want to have some fun this weekend, go to your concordance and look up the fear of the Lord or the fear of God and write out every verse that you find. You will be so blessed you won't know what to do with yourself. And the question then comes as to how do we learn to fear the Lord? Is fearing the Lord something that you are born with or do you learn it? Well, let me suggest to you from the scriptures that I have found, this is something we can learn. In fact, it was taught in the Bible. When we begin to understand the blessings that can be ours by fearing God, we will want to begin doing it, and it is possible to learn how to fear God. The Bible tells us we can do that, and here's some verses that will help you understand what I mean. King David wrote in his Psalms, Come, you children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And Solomon, after he had finished writing the book of Ecclesiastes and had experimented with all the wisdom of the world that he could find and kept coming up with the phrase, and it's all vanity, and it's all vanity, and it's not meaningful. And you remember Solomon was writing the book as if there were no God trying to find out meaning in life without God in the picture. He gets all the way to the end of it, and he comes up with this summary. Listen to this, you guys. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. The last words that a man speaks before his death are often considered highly significant. With that in mind, consider the last words of David, the king, 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And the final words of Joshua, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Did you ever dream the Bible had this much to say about fearing God? Maybe it's the thing we've lost. Maybe we haven't understood that if God wants to bless us, we have to learn how to fear God and hold Him in reverence and read His Word so that we can come to know Him better. Yes, it is possible to love God and fear God. It is possible to know God in this incredible way. The God who is awesome and the God who loves us so much that he gave his son to be our Savior. You know what? I'm so amazed because I, I came out of this study realizing my God is much greater than I even thought. He's so wonderful. He's so marvelous. 
this God we serve. It is the terror of God and our protection in the midst of it that brings such joy and wonder to our hearts. We have a fearful God, but He's the same God who has wrapped His arms around us in the middle of life and loved us to Himself. It is the very wonder of who He is that causes us to be overwhelmed that for such a one as me, He would give Himself as He has. And therefore, I can fear Him and I can love Him. And by loving Him, I learn to fear Him. And by fearing Him, I learn to love Him. And the Bible says that love and fear go together. And here's what I want you to know. If you get this fear right, it will begin to obliterate all of the other fears of your life. For if you... Hey, Diane. It, it's me, Christine. Hey, I told you I'd meet you and the girls for dinner tonight, but I think I'm going to stay in. You've been telling me that I need to get out, and you're right, but I'm still afraid. Hey, um, you have fun with the girls, and I'll catch up with you later. Okay, bye. Here we go. And let's begin. Good evening, honey. Are you ready for our nightly briefing? Fear. Right on time. Oh, honey, you look terrible. No, really. You're a mess. But who can blame you? I mean, look, you live in this house all alone. You're widowed. You're miserable. Destitute. I'm not destitute. It's just a good thing you and Sean put away a little bit of savings, huh? It's funny how just one spray of Sean's aftershave brings me face to face with my fear. Oh, honey, I'm healthy fear. You depress me. And for good reason. I mean, you just need to stay inside, curl up here in the dark, and sleep away the pain. I think it's time for me to move on. You have me afraid to venture outside of these walls. I'm a prisoner in my own house. It is a scary world out there without Sean. I miss Sean. But I need to be around people. I need to go to church. You need to listen to me is what you need to do. Now, are you ready for our nightly chat? No. Of course you are. All right, let's begin. Now, I noticed you have an invitation to Sarah and Michael's wedding, and you need to decline. Well, I thought I should go. What? Attending a wedding will only remind you of, well, you know who. You'll be a wreck. I'm crossing that off your list. Okay. Also, I see that Diane and the girls invited you out for dinner tonight. I just called and canceled, but I'm having second thoughts. Absolutely not. I mean, you'll be sitting around just talking about husbands and jobs and kids, all of which you do not have. Then you'll start crying and your makeup will smear and you'll just be a wreck. I am glad you're not going. You mentioned church. Now, honey, honestly, do you really think hanging around with happy Christians is the best medicine for your condition? It might be. Look, girl, life has handed you a big fat detour. I'm afraid life is never going to get any brighter for you. This is as good as it gets. Wow, you are so encouraging. I am not here to encourage you. You're here to depress me, and you're very good at it. Thank you very much. I'm here for you. I think that's my problem. Your problem is you're sad, but your whole life is sad. How can you move on when there's no hope for the future? I'm tired of being sad. Tired of being depressed. Well, consider that my gift to you. Depression, the fear of mental breakdown. Next, right here on Turning Point. The dictionary defines depression as low spirits, gloomy feelings, dejection, sadness, a condition marked by feelings of worthlessness, failure, and accompanying guilt. You may wonder why I would even address such a subject, why I would talk about something that can be so dark. Well, let me tell you for a few moments why I am doing this as I express to you the epidemic of depression in our culture today. Today, more than one out of every 20 Americans Adults are treated for depression during their lifetime. 
Worldwide, there are 121 million people who are suffering from depression as I speak. The experience of depression is simply this, that depression is a human problem, a fact of life that shouldn't surprise us when we realize that we are imperfect people. We live with other imperfect people in an imperfect world. And when we open our Bibles, we discover a long line of people who struggled with depression. Here from Psalm 32 is an illustration. He says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, God, and your, my vitality was turned into the draught of summer. People in the Bible were depressed. I remember telling you that in the Bible over 200 people are said to have been afraid and that it wasn't just the peripheral people, but it's the main people. The expression of depression there are many expressions in church history and in the Bible, but none are more poignant than the one recorded for us in Job chapter 3. And our biblical character today is none other than Job himself. As you know the story of Job, as the book begins, Job stands naked before his God. Anything or anyone who he might have counted on for help or encouragement has been taken from him. If you read the first two chapters, it's hard to comprehend what it must have been like. A servant would come and tell him of one tragedy, and before that servant could leave, another servant would come and tell him of something else that he had lost. And one after another, Job was reduced until there was nothing left. His wealth was gone. His health was gone. His children were gone. His wife has abandoned him. His misery is indescribable. His outlook is hopeless. And while he rejects the advice of Satan and his wife to curse God and die, Job is despairing of his life. The terrible disasters that are described in the first two chapters are over. Job has managed to weather them with his piety intact. But now the battle has shifted from the outside of his life to the inside of his life. Now it is Job's inner life, his very soul, that is under direct attack. And in the third chapter, he cries out, in three laments about what it's like to be where he is. And anyone who's ever been depressed or has known people who have been depressed and have walked through depression with them will understand completely why Job is lamenting as he is. Let's look at what he says. His first lament in verses 1 through 3, we might title it, Why Did I Arrive? <laughs> he says, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said, A male child is conceived. Job begs that the night of his conception and the day of his birth be blotted from the calendar. These words are the words of a man who is so broken that he no longer cares what he says. Later on in his book, he said that he spoke with rashness, but he just spoke honestly. That's what he felt. He said, Lord God, why did I even have to be born? Why did I arrive? His second lament takes it to the next level. Why did I survive? Verse 11, he says, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Lord, if I had to be born, why couldn't I have just died at childbirth? And then he takes it to the final question, the third lament. Why am I alive? Verse 20 and 21 of the third chapter why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul who long for death but it does not come and search for it more than hidden treasures? Job's third cry is one that is very common today. Job is saying, since I had to be born and I couldn't die in childbirth, why can't I just die now? Not until the end when Job has endured everything that you can imagine, did God finally communicate with him? And he suffered like you will not believe. Could I just pause here for a moment and say, it is a wonderful gift to us that God has put the book of Job in the Bible because it reminds us 
that if we suffer, we are not the only ones. If we go through dark seasons of life, if, as St. John of the Cross said, we live the dark night of the soul, we have been preceded by others who have gone before us, and the record is here. Why would God allow this book to be in the Bible if for no other reason than to encourage us? In fact, if you think you're having a bad day, read the book of Job, and you will feel better about yourself immediately. Remind you now, Job was not depressed because of what had happened. He was depressed because he couldn't figure out why it happened. The reality is that godly believers sometimes get depressed. As you examine depression, you discover that sooner or later, people who know the Lord can find themselves going through a difficult moment, a down moment, a, a depressing moment. Depression has been called the common cold of the soul. Now, I want to answer some questions. Why do people get depressed? I need you to understand, friends, I, I'm a teacher of the Word of God. I'm a pastor. I'm not here to solve all the problems people have through depression. I'm not an expert on depression. I am just a pastor, and I want to help you. So my counsel is going to be rather general and as much as possible based upon what I've learned from the Scripture and from life. But let me tell you why people get depressed. First of all, sometimes people get depressed for situational reasons. For situational reasons. I mean, let's face it, folks. If you were Job, would you be depressed? <laughs> I guess. Sometimes depression is systemic. By that I mean it has something to do with what's going on in your system. <laughs> this is often a surprise to many people. Sometimes there are systemic reasons. One of my favorite sayings goes like this. Our souls and our bodies live so close together that they catch each other's diseases. Did you know that? We all know that. How many of you know that when you don't feel good physically, it's hard to feel good spiritually? Isn't that true? And let me just tell you something. There are things that can go on in the human body that can create depression. Hormonal imbalance, dietary issues, all of these things can contribute to the moods that you feel. And before you go any further, if you have these bouts in your life, check it out. Make sure there's nothing going on. Sometimes there are satanic reasons. I mean, the book of Job is certainly an illustration of that. Here we see Satan at work more than in any other book in the Bible. Do you know that at the beginning, Satan makes a deal with God? He says, let me have Job, and I'll show you he's not as hot as you think he is. <laughs> let me have Job. Let me, let me cause suffering in Job's life, and you'll find out that this guy, Job, that you think is the greatest God, your number one uh, pupil, <laughs> he'll curse you, and, and uh, you'll just wait and see. Now, the interesting thing about this is that God and Satan knew what was going on. They had this deal, but God never told Job. Job never did know about the deal that God had made with Satan to allow Satan to test Job and prove his integrity. Sometimes Satan will try to cause sadness in your life. Satan doesn't usually have anything to do with the bad things that happen. He comes in afterwards to make you misinterpret the bad things that happen. He comes in afterwards and says, God doesn't love you as much as he used to, or God doesn't care about you, and God doesn't, he's not really interested in all. And so Satan uses the tragedy, which he may not have caused, as a talking point in your life to bring depression into your heart. Don't let him do that. Sometimes there are spiritual reasons for depression. If God has allowed a dark time in your life and there's no evidence in, that you know of of any reason for it, just know that he's up to something. And at the end, as we'll see in the life of Job, when the test is finished, you will be better than you were before. Now, let's talk about the expectations of depression. Someone has described this phenomenon in nautical terms like this. The height of the wave determines the depth of the valley that follows it. And the opposite is also true. Sometimes the depth of the valley is a promise of the blessing to come. How many of you know life is lived in a rhythm? 
There's a rhythm about life. Let's get to understand that when it comes to what we're talking about today. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus was baptized? And God broke heaven's silence and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the next verse says, And Satan took him to the wilderness and tempted him for 40 days. After a major mountaintop experience, we need to be ready to face the valley. We were not created to live on the mountain all the time. We weren't created to live in the valley all the time. Life has rhythm to it. Can I get a witness? Everybody got that? Amen. The expectations. Now, let's talk about the elimination of depression. And I'm just going to give you some thoughts that I think might be helpful. Please understand, and let's look up here for just a moment. If you have severe depression, if you suffer depression that is debilitating, that means you can't work or you have days when you can't function, do not, whatever you do, do not not go and get some help. But I am telling you some things you can do to help when these moments come, but I am not trying to stand in the place of a, of a doctor. I'm not a doctor. And I would hate for you to leave here and think that this is all there is. No, if you have severe depression, you need to find medical help. And don't be ashamed to do it. Remember, all of these great people who have suffered with the same thing you suffer with. But having said all of that, here's some things I'd like to suggest. Number one, reveal your depression. Based on the story of Job, I want to suggest that you reveal honestly your depression to the people that you trust. The thing about Job was this. He didn't hide his feelings. Listen to these words from Job 7:11. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Job said, I'm not going to keep this to myself. Here's what's going on in my life. Find somebody you trust and let it all out. Be honest about what you're feeling. You say, well, I'm, I'm. get over it. Find somebody you trust and tell them what's going on in your life. Even in the doing of that, you will feel better. <laughs> Number two, resist your depression. Depression is something to be feared, something to fight. Please listen to me today. Depression is not anything to mess with. Don't let its foot in the door. Don't let anything happen that would cause it to get worse if there's something you can do to cause it to get better. Fight it. Don't coddle it. Treat it as an enemy. Number three, research your depression. I read this from a doctor by the name of Dan Phillips. He said, you should probably see a good doctor. I mean, I don't mean for happy pills. I do not mean for psychological treatment. I mean to eliminate the possibility of physical causes. And we've talked about that already. There might be something going on in your life that you don't know about. Before you do anything else, if you suffer from this, go see a doctor and get a physical. Tell him what's going on in your life and say, I just want to make sure there's not anything systemic going on that's causing this to happen. Number four, replace your depression. Lean into God. Don't lean away from him. Now, let me tell you something that I've discovered. When you go through any kind of trouble in life, listen up. You have to do things that are counterintuitive. By that I mean, if you only do what you feel like doing when you don't feel good, you will always do the wrong thing. What does that mean? Well, when I am down, I don't feel like reading the Bible. Do it anyway. Say to yourself, self? <laughs> I don't feel like reading the Bible, but I'm going to read it anyway. And if you read it quietly in a little corner of your house, go out in the garage and read it out loud. Take action that will bring you toward God, not push him away. Here's the deal. When depression comes, like any problem in life, here is God and here are you. If you let depression get in between you and God, it will push you away. But if you put the depression, if you put the depression out here, it will push you toward God, and then you will have a much better chance to survive. It all depends on where it is. Job cried out to God, but he never cursed God. And the Bible says that when he got all done with his depression, he did not sin. The Bible says that. In his crying out to God for answers and for help, he sinned not. So make sure that what's going on in your life drives you toward your God and not away from him. I need to tell you, most of the people that I know who've gone through tough times, whether it's cancer or some other kind of sickness or family trouble, when they get that principle right, 
they come out of it much stronger in their faith than when they went into it. And then let's talk a little bit about the effect that depression had on Job. (laughs) Even before his testing was over, Job expressed this thought. And this is a great verse for you to remember. Job 23.10, here's what it says. But God knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And after it was over, he expressed gratitude for what had happened in his life. In Job 42, he said, God, before this thing, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job lived in triumph in his faith. In Job 13, he says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's what I mean. That's counterintuitive when you're going through trouble. But that's what you say in your heart. That's what you mean in your spirit. Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't have any explanation for this. But Lord, if you slay me, I'm still going to trust you. That's what Job said. There's life after depression. There's victory after the test. And yes, there's joy after the despair. The first time you go through a downtime in your life, wow, it's how in the world am I ever going to deal with this? This is awful. And then somehow God helps you through it and you get through the first one. And uh, the next time it comes, you realize, you know, this is really hard and, and this is emotional. But I've been through this once before and I know that God was with me. And you know what else? I know how it turns out. You've heard me laugh at Donna because she reads the last chapter of her books before she finishes reading the book. But I'm beginning to realize she's more right about that than I am. When you read the last chapter, you don't get traumatized by the events that happen leading up to it because while it looks like it's going to end here, you know it's not. It's not going to end here. And when it ends, it's a good ending. Let me just ask you something today, class. Don't you know that this life is not our final place and that we're going through some things right now one of these days we're going to get to the ending but we already know what it is so when we already know what it is let's give ourselves a little space let's step back and say Lord I forgot about this stuff we have to go through down here but I'm so encouraged because I know we're going to make it through to the end and we're going to do so with our hands lifted up high and uh, Difficult to love, Landon, and not very talented either. Remember how embarrassed you were when you were cut from the high school basketball team? I wanted to try out again the next year, but... But I told you, why bother? You'll just get cut again. Yes, you did. I was just trying to protect you. I know. That's why I was afraid to make any friends. To try out for a college scholarship or to... You got a girlfriend? Yes. I didn't want to be... Turned down? Yes. And when you ignored my advice, you did get turned down, didn't you? Your bride left you standing alone at the altar. Yes. This is what happens when you don't listen to me. And while I applaud your efforts at the jobs in which you've been applying, you probably won't get them. You'll be rejected. Not so fast. And took him to the high priest. Peter and some of the other disciples wanted to see what happened, and they followed at a distance. And he and another disciple were allowed into the high priest's courtyard to await the outcome of Jesus before the high priest. While they waited... Three different people asked Peter if he was one of Jesus' disciples. And each time, he denied it. After Peter's third denial, a rooster began to crow, just as Jesus had predicted. And Peter knew that he had done just exactly what Jesus said he would do. Now, Peter's fear, you see, was rooted in the Jewish leader's disapproval of Jesus and his followers. He feared that their disapproval could easily result in his own arrest, So he lied, and he denied knowing his leader. And the crow of the rooster brought home to Peter what he had done. And the Bible says he went out, and he wept bitterly. The reality of the fear of disapproval is on the night Jesus was arrested, 
Peter encountered people representing three different dynamics. Let's look at how he responded to all of them. These are all very interesting. They're unique, and yet Peter shows us what happens when we fear disapproval in every situation. It begins with what we might call an unexpected fear. And John 18, 17 has the story. The first person that Peter encountered was a servant girl at the high priest's house who was assigned the task of keeping the door. And she brought Peter into the courtyard and she asked him, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And caught off guard, Peter just mumbled the first thing that came to his mind. He said, I am not. I am not. Peter's unexpected fear is a warning. Decide in advance what you believe. Decide in advance who you are loyal to so that when you are under pressure, you don't have to stop and consider what to do. You already know what to do. It's embedded in your soul. It was kind of an unexpected fear. And then the next one is sort of an understandable fear. Again, in the 18th chapter of John, we're told the story. After leaving the servant girl, Peter moved quickly to disappear into a group of servants and officers who had made a fire of coals in the high priest's courtyard. John 18, 18, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. This group was already in place when Peter showed up. He didn't know any of these people, obviously. He had no relationships with any of them. He just sort of nonchalantly and unobtrusively stood around the fire sort of to disappear among the group. But he hadn't been there for but a moment, and verse 25 tells us that someone said, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And fear came over Peter, and he lied a second time, denying his association with Jesus. Peter was caught in the classic peer pressure of one person being intimidated by a group. That person said, you are not also one of his, are you? And I see Peter looking around at all the eyes that are staring at him, not one of them friendly toward him. And he said, I am not. Flashback to your junior high school days. You're in a social setting with kids from your school, and they offer you a cigarette or some alcohol or even a pill. And you hesitate, and then the pressure starts. What are you, afraid? Hey, look, it's Mama's boy, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. It's probably past your bedtime, kid. Maybe you should call your mommy to come and get you. And so it goes. On that moment hangs everything you've wanted since you were in the second grade. Respect, inclusion, acceptance, and status. If you say yes, you're in. And if you say no, there will be no more invitations to any parties to come your way. And all of us are kind of shaking our heads up and down because we remember that. We know what that was like. Now, the third time is, is the one that makes the most sense in many respects. But for you to understand this, I have to give you a little background to it. This is what we'll call an unsurprising fear. Once again, it's also in John chapter 18. But let me set the stage for what happened. The third accusation against Peter seems to have been the most threatening and the least surprising. It gives us another window into the nature of fear. Now, if you remember, when the Jewish leaders came to Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, they came with soldiers. And Peter wasn't afraid then. He took out his sword and he cut off the right ear of one of the servants. The man's name was Malchus, a servant of the Jewish high priest. And he rebuked Peter, and he told Peter to put his sword away, and then Jesus reached out and healed Malchus's ear. Now back to the courtyard of the high priest where Peter's warming himself at the fire. And he just become the center of attention when someone suggested that he was one of Jesus' disciples, and for the second time he had said no. But suddenly another high priest servant became very interested. If you have your Bibles open, this is in verse 26. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see you in the garden with him? And now Peter knows he is in real trouble. This isn't just an incidental. This isn't some servant girl or a bunch of strangers. 
Here's a relative, a kinsman of the person who Peter cut the guy's ear off. But once again, Peter had to stick to his lie. And he denied again that he knew Jesus. And verse 27 says, and immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. He had so buried himself in his lies about Jesus that he couldn't change it now. How many of you know that when you tell one lie, you often have to tell another to cover up the first one, and before you know it, you're just telling the same thing over and over again, at least trying to be consistent in your lying. <laughs> and that was Peter succumbing to the disapproval of men. Now, you all know that story, and I've just kind of given you a refresher on it, but let me go back now, and let's take this apart and see if we can discover the reasons why Peter failed and why he succumbed to the fear of disapproval. First thing we notice is that Peter was filled with himself. When we fear others, it's usually because we're too enamored with ourselves. Here's another interesting thing that comes out of the greater context. He failed to pray. It's interesting that people who depend on themselves usually don't pray. Because what is prayer? Prayer is our declaration of dependence. When we pray, what we're saying is, Lord, I haven't got this all sorted out yet, and I really need you. If we think we've got it all sorted out, we're not very prone to pray. I mean, why would we pray? We don't need God. We got it all together. When we find ourselves fearful of others' disapproval, it may be because we haven't spent enough time in prayer reminding ourselves of our dependence on Christ. Here's the third reason. We function in the energy of the flesh. In Matthew's account of what happened in Gethsemane, we know that Peter was walking in the energy of the flesh because most obviously it was demonstrated by his attack on the high priest's servant. Peter wasn't in the spirit when he did that. You say, well, didn't God tell Peter to do it? Absolutely not. No one in the high priest's party had attacked Jesus. Peter went on the offensive on his own, making an unprovoked attack with a sword. What was he thinking? You see how absurd this is when Jesus responds. Listen, all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels, thousands of angels? If I had been Peter, I would have turned beet red with embarrassment. Here I am, a lowly fisherman, wielding a seldom-used sword, trying to defend someone who had legions of angels waiting at his command to strike. Give me a break. Why didn't Jesus call his angels? He didn't call his angels because, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Here's what Peter was doing, and we do it too. Peter was trying to help God out. <laughs> he was saying, in essence, I don't think the Father in heaven can take care of the Son on earth, so I'm going to have to intervene and help God. Isn't that what we do sometimes? We see something and we go off half-cocked in our own energy and our own flesh, and we think we're going to fix it. We don't pray. So if we don't pray, we don't have any word from God. So we get in a situation where we could be under pressure, and we just go bull, bull ahead, and then we get in trouble. And that, that's Peter. That's classic Peter. Here's the fourth thing. We follow Jesus from afar. This is one of the most interesting parts of the story, in my estimation. Luke twenty two fifty four 54 says, Having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now, what's going on here, class, is this. Peter was following afar. He was a follower of Jesus, but not really, not really. Let's don't go too far with this. If we're not careful, we follow Jesus afar off and then Number five, we find our fellowship in the wrong place. He had, in so many ways, switched sides. Because of his fear of what they might do to him, because of what they had done to Jesus, he's over here on their side trying to make peace with them so that the same thing that's going to happen to Jesus doesn't happen to him. 
And so it's a reminder to us that who we hang out with usually has something to do with how we function. If you can hang out with people that don't know the Lord and be called and strong in your testimony so that they know who you are from the outset, then you have a chance. But if you don't allow that to happen, you will be victimized. Those are the realities of the fear of disapproval and some of the reasons for it. I want to finish up with some resolutions to help us get on the other side of it. And there's an act three to all of this. The Bible tells us in John 21 that Jesus went after Peter and he met him and the other disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it was there that Peter discovered this good news, that even though he had miserably failed the Lord in the test of loyalty, it was possible to be restored. And here's what Jesus did for Peter and what he can do for us. Replace our fear of others with his approval of us. I want you to know all of us who at one time or another have been afraid of disapproval and have in our own way denied the Lord. All we have to do is come back and ask for forgiveness and the Lord will forgive us. And as we're going to see, he can do more than forgive us. He can change us. The next thing I notice that we can do is to replace our fear of others with our love for him. As you read John chapter 21, you read about this interchange between Jesus and Peter, and three times in three verses, Jesus asks Peter the same question. He says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And you can almost sense in Peter's response, he's a little annoyed by it. Jesus, you know that I love you. Three times he solicited a response from Peter to solidify the relationship that he had with him in love. Thirdly, replace our fear of others with love for others. When Peter answered the question that he loved the Lord and he said, Lord, you know that I love you, Jesus told him to do something again three times. In a little different wording, he said, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. You say, what is that all about? Well, Jesus is saying to Peter, now, now that you've got it straight, now that you know where your loyalty lies, live out your life for others. And when you're so involved in serving God in the lives of other people, you don't have time to be afraid of what they say. Number four, we can replace our fear of others with faith in him. Jesus now gives Peter a little forecast of his life. The Lord Jesus said, Peter, I want you to know this. Now that you've come through this test, I want you to know life is not going to be easy for you. He said to him in John 21, 18 and 19, but Peter, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus spoke signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And if you know the story, the secular historians tell us how it happened. Peter was arrested and they crucified him. But before he was crucified, he requested that he be hung upside down because he did not believe that he was worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. He faced a lot of other tests. The Lord Jesus said to Peter, you're going to face some challenges. In essence, in the world, you will have tribulation. But the rest of that is, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. After Peter was restored by the Lord and took a new look at what God had called him to do, he was a changed person. With the other disciples, he preached a powerful sermon to the massive crowds in Jerusalem who were gathered on the day of Pentecost. And when he got done, he gave this, he gave this conclusion to his sermon. See if this sounds like Peter before or Peter after. Here's what he said. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says the, the sermon was so powerful that people came from everywhere and 3,000 souls were converted on that day. Here's Peter failing because of his fear. And here's Peter excelling because of his faith. And we have to live our lives out in one of the two ways, don't we? We either live in fear or we live in faith. Here's how it works. If you are in the right fear relationship with God, you need fear no man. If you know who God is and you understand,